Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sabine Zielke, and on behalf of the North American Studies Program and the America House NRV, I'd like to welcome you warmly to our Martin Luther King Day event, a tradition of our program since 2003. Once again, this year's MLK event takes place in cooperation with the America House in Cologne, and we are highly grateful for the support of Dr. Becker and his team. Please note that on their special request, we are recording this discussion tonight. This year, our event does not feature a lecture, but a panel discussion that zooms in on the question of how Black lives matter in the US and in Germany. A timely topic, since this Wednesday, a president will be sworn into office who owes his success to a large part to African-American voters. Therefore, I'm particularly pleased to be able to welcome our five panelists tonight, Sabina Aretz, uh, an alumna of our program who wrote her MA thesis with a focus on Black Lives Matters, Don Lohman, a teacher at our institute engaged in, among many other matters, anti-racist initiatives, and three renowned colleagues from the fields of American studies and history, all of whom have focused on African-American and race issues in their research and publications. Professor Dr. Sabine Brock from the University of Bremen, Professor Dr. Rebecca Brückmann from the University of Bochum and Professor Dr. Manfred Berg from the Heidelberg Center for American Studies. Unfortunately, due to an illness, my colleague and co-moderator, Professor Dr. Anke Ortlep, was not able to join us. We will have a Q&A session at the end, uh, probably 20 to 30 minutes, and we also agreed that the panelists will introduce themselves briefly um, later. Before that, however, I would like to say a few words on the occasion. In the US, MLK Day is a national holiday observed on the third Monday of January every year honoring the birthday of theologian, activist, and civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King on January 15, 1929. King would have turned 92 this week, last week, had he not been assassinated at Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, in April 1968. MLK holiday was celebrated for the first time in 1986, after almost 20 years of propositioning by many prominent and less prominent people and institutions. Many others, though, strongly objected to the idea of commemorating a man who, in their eyes, represented the liberal post-1960s America they so despised, and who, like Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina, denounced King as an action-oriented Marxist. This, of course, sounds very familiar, thus MLK Day remains a timely event indeed. The fact that America honors the legacy of Martin Luther King also bears witness, though, to a transformation that has been a long time coming, as President Obama put it in his acceptance speech back in 2008. And the question how far we have traveled in the last almost 60 years since Dr. King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech during the March on Washington on 28 August 1963 will be part of our debate tonight. After all, King also insisted that the issues he raised, and I quote, are questions about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth questions that are even more pressing today than there are than there were five decades ago. Honoring Martin Luther King Day 2021, our panel focuses on the Black Lives Matter movement and its protests against systemic racism and police violence in the United States and their echo in Germany. While highly relevant for a fight against racism, such solidarity raises the question how cultural conditions in the US and Germany compare. Do the terms, attitudes, strategies, and goals we adopt fit our own cultural conflicts? How have race issues 
racism and xenophobia affected lives, institutions and policy, politics in Germany? Does the attention to racism cir circumnavigate the significance of economic inequality and classism, not to speak of systemic sexism? And what impact have Black and Afro-German activism had on cultural communication and social interaction around here? These are some of the questions our debate will address. So without much ado, I'd like to hand things over to our guests who will introduce themselves and speak briefly about how their own work relates to the issues we raise. And I suggest uh, we go by uh, alphabet. And uh, so the first would be uh, Ms. Aretz okay. to introduce herself. Thanks yeah. for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Um... Uh, to briefly introduce myself, my name is Sabina Haretz. I very, very recently graduated from the North American Studies program here in Bonn, which is also um, where I got my BA two years ago, a little over that. Um, yeah, and uh, Black Lives Matter has accompanied me throughout my studies, both in my, um, or particularly in my master's program. And I uh, finished by writing my master thesis about race, capital, racism, capitalism, and the collective identities of Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street in comparison to one another. And what I was and am particularly interested in is Black Lives Matter's inner movement discourse and how it constructs and communicates a collective movement identity, especially given Black Lives Matter's uh, kind of rejection of leadership and its decentralized structure, which maybe makes it a little more difficult to grasp what exactly it is we're talking about when we are talking about Black Lives Matter. And I think uh, through that collective identity construction that I understand as an unfixed narrative process, um, still evolving, of course, uh, it becomes clear that Black Lives Matter demands a conversation not only about racism, but also or not only about race, but also about class and with that about America's uh, capitalism. And I think exploring these aspects um, under the light of Black Lives Matter as a, as a, as a movement and Kind of a brand name almost now, uh, I think that might give us an insight in the image Black Lives Matter projects, how we can understand it and um, maybe drive the discussion of Black Lives Matter's uh, grievances um, further now, even in a global context beyond the United States uh, as Black Lives Matter have, has proven itself to be particularly attractive um, throughout uh, different countries as well. So yeah, I'm excited for the discussion here to unfold. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I said alphabetically, uh, alphabetical order, and that this this makes uh, Manfred back the next one uh, in line, so to speak. Well, thank you, Sabine, and I also like to thank you for including me in this discussion. My name is Manfred Berg. I'm a historian at Heidelberg University, and I've been a historian of U.S. history who has worked on the history of the civil rights movement, American race relations, racial violence and uh, racism for around about 30 years now. Um, my, perhaps if you permit me to mention my most pertinent English language books, uh, they include a history of the National Association mm -hmm. for the Advancement of Colored People titled The Ticket to Freedom, a history of lynching in America entitled Popular Justice. And I've also uh, co-edited a volume on racism in the modern world, historical perspectives on cultural transfer and adaptation. And I've also always been very interested in the history of criminal justice in the United States, which uh, obviously bears a close relationship to the topic of our discussion today. I think it is fair uh, that I clarify my normative perspective. Uh, I'm an uh, unapologetic liberal who believes in the equality of rights and uh, opportunities in non-discrimination as well as in equal recognition uh, in dignity. In a way, since this is Martin Luther King Day, I um, uh, would say that my normative perspective continues to be informed by 
Martin, both Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, as well as by his later critique of uh, social injustice in the years uh, before his um, death. And uh, that'll be my introduction for the moment. That makes me- I knew right? that would happen. Thank you very much, and uh, Sabine. Look, Sabina, you're, you're in line, <laughs> the next one. Thank you, Thank you for inviting me. Um, I would like to frame my answers here in that I am trying to speak not as a specialist, um, even though you might say um, as an ex-professor of American studies, um, I could be considered somewhat of a specialist in African-American literature. But I, I'd much rather talk here as what I have been calling a spoken to. Um, I want to heed the growing radical exhaustion of black people here and in the US with notions of redemption in the future. So I think that's quite fitting for Martin Luther King Day. King was already impatient in and with his time and he struggled radically against being consigned to keep on dreaming about a different world towards the end of his life. So he published Why We Can't Wait, a very telling title already in 1965, if you think about how long that is ago. In my view of the solidarity protests in Germany last year, I think an understanding of white pornotroping pleasure, which is a titillation by watching a violence that will, knowing that it will never hurt you as a white person is running low. I think it's also overdue to articulate a specific where of white scholarship that has overstayed its welcome as I myself have learned indeed in the last few years. I think white scholarship needs to turn from a parasitical participation in black studies by way of white on black ethnography and by ethnography, I don't mean it tied to a specific discipline towards a critical break with our white legacy, our white legacy, humanism's premises and promises, towards reading Western legacies of white abjectorship in the name of humanism, as in slavery. That's what I have been thinking and writing about in the last few years, and I won't bore you with titles because you can easily Google it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina. Um, and next, on our list is uh, Professor Brockmann. Welcome again. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, uh, the invitation. I'm happy to be here. My name is Rebecca Brockmann. I am an assistant professor uh, for the history of North America in its transcultural context at Ruhr University. I'm afraid I don't have the track record yet that Manfred Back has. I've been doing this for 10 years, not for 30 years, but you know, there's always hope. Um, I uh, came to the Rio University um, through stations in Berlin and Cologne. In Cologne, I had the honor of teaching some of the North American Studies program students at the University of Bonn as well. So, hello. And then through Kassel. And um, I'm particularly interested both in the Black freedom struggle, especially uh, in the 20th century, but essentially since 1865. And I have a particular focus on white resistance, especially the white resistance of white women. Um, I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion here. I'm going to say that if you're interested in that, I have just published a book with the University of Georgia Press on massive resistance in Southern womanhood. I'm particularly interested in the history of white resistance uh, because it has somewhat been under-narrated in its complexity to my understanding, because we're not talking about uh, uh, hicks and rednecks, essentially, we're talking about a system of white supremacy and a system of white resistance. So this is what I'm focusing on. I also think in, on Martin Luther King Day, it's particularly important to remember that in 1967, actually 63% of all Americans opposed Martin Luther King, according to a Gallup poll. And Martin Luther King was most unpopular at the time. So what I'm interested in in my teaching, my research is also deconstructing some of the um, uh, pacifying myths that have been developed during the past decades on the civil rights movement and its tactics, and also to look at the continuity as well as the differences between civil rights activism, the tactics, the strategies, particularly grassroots activism such as SNCC or CORE, so the Student Nonviolent Co Coordinating Committee or the Congress of Racial Equality um, with Black Lives Matter today. 
So I would like to look, have, a, have a broader look essentially at the black freedom struggle in both this continuity and its differences because it's not static, there are pro, there's progress, but there's also regression. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're looking forward to hearing more. Um, so, and our last uh, participant is Don Lohman. Uh, Don, uh, welcome again. Uh, thank you, Professor Zielka. Um, yeah, I wanna start actually with a, a quote from, I think is fitting from Martin Luther King uh, that said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects all directly. And with that, I want to take a minute and um, give land recognition while I'm not in the US, but um, to the places I come from in the US, Portland, Oregon, and Jacksonville, Florida, to the native peoples um, whose land was stolen there. So Multnomah, the Chinook, um, and the Timucua people. And to recognition to uh, the people who built the lands that are now the US, the enslaved people that were stolen from Africa. And I think with that, that symbols matter that um, there needs to be more awareness brought to this. I think going to what um, Professor Brookman said about um, dismantling myths, um, such as that there's this awakening after, uh, you know, we had this I had a dream speech and the civil rights movement and all of a sudden everything was equal and the racist history was forgotten. But um, the US is littered still with signs of genocide, cultural genocide, colonialism and slavery in forms of street names, statues. And I think um, Black Lives Matter has brought awareness to a lot of that, um, has brought a lot of these things in to the cultural center and that we're discussing these things now is very important. Um, for myself, um, I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of Bonn. Um, I was also in Castle before, so I was excited to hear that as well. Um, and I teach uh, regional studies and I do a lot of um, looking at people's histories, not the what's generally been taught in history books, but trying to tell the lesser known stories and give a more complete um, rounded look at those things. So looking at um, indigenous histories, um, black histories, other, uh, other peoples that were not the, the normative central um, white history of America. So, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I have said this before to my colleagues that I encourage discussion among each other. It's sort of difficult on Zoom. Um, I address my questions to uh, particular participants, but the, the floor is open. So uh, just intervene as you like. Before we come to the German echo of the Black Lives Matter movement, I would like to take a closer look at Black Lives Matter in the US, a movement that formed in the summer of 2013 after the acquittal of George Zimmerman who shot the teenager Trey and Martin in February 2012, and that became more and more visible in 2014, protesting the violent death of Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and many more to follow. And my first question uh, goes to Ms. Aretz, um, who uh, just very recently uh, focused a lot on the collective identities of uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, can you tell us, um, what are the strategies and the actual uh, explicit goals and the self-conception of Black Lives Matter in the US? Um, yeah, I, I first wanna focus on goals because I think it's kind of relevant to establish first why that is such a broad topic for Black Lives Matter specifically, not only because it's a decentralized movement and, and prides itself to be that, but also because it, with its agenda, it unsurprisingly addresses issues in basically all facets of the past and current political, social, and cultural realities in the United States. And I think that aspect is already one part of, of Black Lives Matter's strategy and goal, um, meaning when we think about uh, when it emerged, still during uh, Obama's presidency and during a time where there, was, um, there were discussions about uh, kind of having moved beyond race and racism being post-race and Black Lives Matter certainly kind of emerged in opposition to that, that making a strong um, case for that these issues need to be, be brought back into the center as there are 
as they are omnipresent. Um, and I think uh, kind of standing against the this post-race myth and, and um, clearly uncovering it, it as such as a myth is, is one part of um, kind of how Black Lives Matter moved into now the center of our cultural dialogue. Um, there are a sp few specific goals though that I kind of want to point out here, um, especially in the inner movement discourse. When we think about how waves of Black Lives Matter uh, emerge, if you want to call it waves, then uh, the kind of the, the, fir the first goals that are brought into the center are the prosecution of the police office and officers involved in some of these highly publicized acts of police brutality. But connected to that are always uh, demands of thinking about police and policing in general, its history and um, its reform. While defund the police now might seem like a new slogan, it is certainly not a new notion in uh, in Black Lives Matter. And um, this, this aspect reaches from passing a certain act like the Breathe Act to, if we're talking about inner movement discourse, even to, to police and prison uh, abolition. Um, with that connected to that are discussions about the war on drugs and mass incarceration uh, policies ending that as well as welfare and healthcare reform. And um, I think especially in these areas, the, the most specific goals emerge. And um, here, I think that's the part where strategies kind of go in different directions between um, reform, reforming, and basically a new um, imagining of, of political and social, social structures. Um, and, and when we think about the, the movement for black lives, kind of this, this umbrella movement uh, um, under which Black Lives Matter falls, uh, economic justice quickly comes to the center of that. And um, which brings me to self-conception. I think that's a, a big part of, of Black Lives Matter self-conception, especially when I'm thinking about kind of the, the rhetoric of Black Lives Matter's founders. Um, and I know we'll get to that later on more, but they are not shy to, to bring um, anti-capitalist uh, demands, goals and, and that label, I wanna say, uh, into the conversation and, uh, and focus on economic injustice as well. And I think um, that part of, of understanding the movement, understanding itself as um, uh, reimagining society and going back to kind of the roots uh, of, of, of um, um, American history and, and um, connections there from racism to capital, capitalism is a, a foundational part of Black Lives Matter and why um, uh, conversation, conversation, conversations about kind of um, historically anchoring um, current grievances are um, pr present and, and ought to be present. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, um, Don, you have taught uh, Black Lives Matter, the movement, uh, in, in your lectures and in your seminars. Uh, and I, I was wondering, I mean, uh, did you talk about the concrete policies that actually came out of the movement? Can you say a little bit more about that? What, what policies have been brought on the way? Police reform was already men mentioned. Uh, the funding of the police is, of course, something that has been debated, highly controversial. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what policies have actually been brought on the way? Yeah. Um... I'll say, I guess, continuing with the police thing and instead in general, just a few examples that I think um, as far as police reform, um, you've had several cities and major um, cities such as New York, DC, Chicago, Washington um, that have now outlawed the use of chokeholds, um, which is obviously long overdue. Um, you've had where Breonna Taylor, who still hasn't had anyone has not been convicted or even tried to be sentenced um, and put on trial. Uh, they have outlawed no-knock warrants on this. These were both policies that were pushed by uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, the defund the police, uh, you've seen several cities where they've slashed budgets. And one of the biggest goals, I think is something that's often misunderstood that has the idea that there will be no police, it'll just be anarchy. Um, the idea is to um, anything from, yes, get rid of police completely to uh, more, let's allocate funds elsewhere, that there's way too much money being spent on police force um, and police that are disproportionately incarcerating um, and seeking out people of color. 
Um, so one example, uh, New York, the, the state has slashed um, $1 billion from its almost $90 billion budget um, to go into things such as healthcare, um, housing for um, um, black communities. Um, th this has happened in several states where they're trying to reallocate funds. I'm specifically looking at, and this is one of the demands of Black Lives Matter as well, to spend money on um, uh, the Breathe Act was mentioned by uh, Sabina about um, putting things into health care, mental health care, um, uh, economic equity, putting uh, reforms into housing so that we have better outcomes for everyone. Um, I think one of the biggest things that, I don't know if it's people are often looking for these concrete things such as this, but that can't be forgotten is simply um, awareness that's come about due to Black Lives Matter, that we have things such as um, racist policy, white privilege, equity are things that are in the general lexicon nowadays that we weren't talking about only a few years ago. And because of this, I think it's interesting to see the view of um, racism and Black Lives Matter in the US. Um, one poll said that uh, recently 76% of Americans consider racism and discrimination a big problem in the US, which is up from only 51% in 2015. And I think those two things coincide obviously with Trump's presidency, but also the growth of Black Lives Matter and protest in the street. Um, so I think some of those are the, those are some of the big things that have happened and um, also several statues and uh, Confederate flags being taken down. So the Confederate flag is now banned from NASCAR, something almost unthinkable. Um, this was led both by Black Lives Matter, but also by Bubba Wallace, the only black driver in NASCAR. Um, the NFL apologized and said they now support Black Lives Matter. Now we can get into whether these are honest and real um, feelings of apologies, similar to the Washington football team finally getting rid of a racist name. Um, but it's started this change. They haven't apologized to Colin Kaepernick, which they should, but um, they did apologize. Um, the Confederate flag was removed from the state flag of Mississippi, something that was also almost unthinkable um, years ago. And again, back to what I said, I think this coincides with you have Trump on the one hand and Black Lives Matter pushing these changes on the other. And um, just to the monuments again, I think the mayor of New Orleans said it really well. He said, these monuments purposely celebrate fictional sanitized Confederacy, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement and terror that actually stood for. Whereas Trump said, um, these beautiful monuments, removing them is foolish and sad to see history and culture of our great country being ripped apart. Um, so I think those are some of the big things, the changes within the police force and the awareness on um, the changes of some of the laws um, that have been pushed by Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Um, when we talk about Black resistance movements, uh, we often think mainly of men as activists. Of course, we have talked about Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X comes to mind, even though there was Angela Davis and of course many other women. Uh, uh, Professor Beukman, um nowadays women are at the forefront uh, of racist, anti-racist political activism or politics. Uh, we may even think of Stacey Abrams' heroic and amazing mobilization of democratic uh, and black voters. But there are many, there were many black women on the shortlist uh, for the position of vice president. Um, what has been the role of women uh, and their impact uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement? It's a very important question. I'm going to come to it in just a second. I'm just going to have a side note on what Ms. Aretz and Don said. Because I think police brutality, and, we, and you very rightly said, that goes back to a long line of the Black freedom struggle. And we can come back to Martin Luther King, who in his speech at the March on Washington said, that he condemns the unspeakable horrors of police brutality against black people that is oftentimes forgotten even in that speech. And then just one more remark, because I think it's very important what Don said concerning that so many people believe that racism is actually an issue right now in the United States. I would counter in a way that if you look at other 
um, other, uh, other questionnaires. And um, if you ask people who they actually believe is most discriminated against, a lot of white people respond white people. So a lot of white people actually see that racism is a problem, but actually at the same time think they're the most being discriminated against. And when you, when, what you just talked about, about the, the, uh, the removal of Confederate statues, I absolutely agree. At the same time, in my, um, in my estimation, and please contradict me and tell me that I'm wrong, a lot of it is symbolic, is a lot of symbolic change. Um, for, and a lot of people obviously have campaigned for that for a long time, and it is important because recognition is one part of justice, but so is representation redistribution. And particularly the redistribution part is something that we don't talk about a lot. But that brings me back to the actual question. And um, obviously, I mean, women have played an important role in Black Lives Matter. There are over 80 regional groups right now, and Black Lives Matter has been founded by three women, by Alicia Garza, by Patrice Collars Khan, and by Opal Tometi. They have uh, affiliations with San Francisco State University. And like you said, um, already said, it has been founded in the aftermath of the acquittal of George Zimmerman. And Alicia Garza wrote at the time that Black Lives Matter should be an answer to the anti-Black racism that permeates our society and also our social movements. So that was a critique of society, but also of the responses of other activists already present. Um, she said that um, the non-addressing essentially of racism and other social movements, such as the labor movement, she mentioned that specifically, leads to the systemic devaluation and attack on Black lives. So Given the fact that one in a thousand black men will die at the hands of the police, according to a study of Rutgers University in 2019, the focus has been on black men and on police violence, as you said, absolutely. However, and quite similar to previous black freedom activism, the founders of Black Lives Matter have proposed, and Ms. Aratz has already talked about that, an intersectional agenda of social justice, and women play an important role in the movement. And just very briefly, I'm a historian, so stop me, I'm talking too much, but Belinda Robnett came forward with that idea of women as bridge leaders. So back in the civil rights movement, she said that women were forming essentially intermediate layer between the constituency of the social movement and its leadership class. That has long been true for the 1950s, and 1960s, but with the advent of grassroots movements, such as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Comedy and the Black Panther to a certain degree as well, you can find many aspects of these organizational structures and strategies also in Black Lives Matter today. And these structures put an emphasis on, um, on networks, networks rather than hierarchies, and on continually rotating leadership positions. And this is why women have often come to the fore in these organizations. It reminds me of Ella Baker who said, strong people don't need strong leaders. So the one part is the organizational structure of Black Lives Matter that is decentralized. The other part is there's actually a program within Black Lives Matter that's, that especially addresses what they call heteropatriarchy, sexism, and poverty, and how these interplay in the history of white supremacy. So it's important to remember that Black Lives Matter is obviously also about police brutality against black men, but also black women experience police brutality, but it's also against structural discrimination in an intersectional lens on the labor market, on the housing market, in healthcare, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Uh, we will talk more about building these bridges and there is there are hands up uh, by Don and by uh, Ms. Aratz who was uh, first and we accept that now. <laughs> so, Have I offended you? <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, you didn't. You didn't but... Yeah, it called for responses. So, <laughs> Ms. Aaron. I just want to quickly add something to what Professor, Professor Brückmann said, which I think is really important um, because you mentioned um, the, the three uh, founders of, of Black Lives Matter and in their writings, um, what is often also emphasized is the, um, their desire to center um, queer people of color in this movement and address um, intersectionality in this regard as well. And I think um, in, in many discussions of Black Lives Matter that uh, might um, uh, seem like, like a small part or is not recognized um, as central, but I, I do um, read it as central to the movement and not only in its founding, but, but also in its um, existence uh, currently, how it unfolds and in different um, kind of local chapters of the movement as well. Thank you. Don? 
Yeah, I wanted to say something similar with um, the intersectionality and touch on what uh, Professor Brookman said and what you said as well, um, Sabina, um, about the intersectionality, and especially with queer people and awareness that Black Lives Matter has raised um, and kind of connecting to the redistribution that there's been more awareness of people from uh, queer rights movements, such as people are talking now about uh, trans people at uh, Stonewall and leading Stonewall, such as Marsha P. Wash uh, Marshall Washington, talking about Compton cafeteria riots and bringing awareness um, to the Transgender Day of Awareness, where um, this year or the last 12 months, the most uh, trans people ever have been killed in the U.S., um, which can be seen directly as a result of some of Trump's policies and disproportionately that they are um, trans women of color. Um, and with redistribution, I also wanted to respond to that. I completely agree with you. Um, some of these things I think are just done because they have to be. And I think I was touching on that. And I think that's where it's important to, um, when we're looking at the passing of John Lewis last year and the fact that the most famous bridge that you see over and over again is the Edmund Pettus Bridge is still named after a KKK leader. And there's a push to rename it as the John Lewis Bridge. But I would also advocate that, um, there should be some sort of plaque saying why this was renamed and the racist history of it. Um, so I completely agree with you. And the last thing which you said about the, the poll, I, um, with white people feeling the most slighted, I think that's absolutely imperative that we talk about that as well, because that's what comes up again and again, I think, um, with some of these terms that are being brought to the forefront, such as white privilege and that um, white people disproportionately feel that equity leads to a stripping of their rights, which is absolutely ridiculous. So I think those are all wonderful points. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to look a little bit into history. Um, Manfred, you've mentioned a couple of your publications, but I always uh, enjoy your uh, illuminating contributions for Die Zeit. Uh, you uh, write there as, a, as an expert on the history of the civil rights movement and race relations. Um, in a recent issue of Die Zeit, um, there was uh, an article featured um, um, by Angela Kukritz that, who, that draw a direct line from the 1920s Harlem Renaissance to the Black Lives Matter movement. And, I, I personally had some issues with that article. How would you position the movement within a history of race relations in the US? So where are we coming from and where, where are we now, so to speak? Uh, well, I also think that uh, these continuities are often quite artificial and they are also quite often uh, the result of um, Suggestions from the editors, uh, one might say. <laughs> uh, one might say. Uh, now, uh, there's a famous line by Xu Enlai, who was once asked that uh, what he thought about the historical significance of the his, uh, French Revolution, and he said it was too early to tell. Um, so uh, I think it is quite difficult to say where uh, where does Black Lives Matter stand in the history of the black freedom struggle, which is obviously a very long history that goes all the way back to uh, slavery during the colonial uh, age. Um, so at the risk of shameless simplification, I would nevertheless throw out the idea that the key question in uh, my uh, view is that um, that really runs through American history is whether America can live up to its liberal and egalitarian creed or whether American society is so irredeemably racist that the only solution for black is some form of separatism. Um, and again, I would say that Martin Luther King uh, never despaired of the possibility to a, um, to a, uh, to build interracial coalitions. Um, personally, I would admit that uh, upon the election of Barack Obama, I was rather uh, optimistic, but that optimism has now been proven premature. Uh, it is clear, and I think most scholars agree on this, that uh, uh, racial resentment has been a key factor in the rise of uh, Donald Trump and uh, white nationalism 
in general. Um, and um, yeah, I, I'm, for me, it's really difficult. I've, I've, before the election, I have repeatedly pointed out that there are viable analogies between the current situation and the pre-Civil War uh, era, unless you believe that a civil war must feature uniformed armies uh, facing each other in the field. Um, and um, so I think really that the, the recent elections demonstrated uh, that it is only a broad interracial coalition. If we accept the, the, uh, the unpleasant notion that American democracy is currently seriously endangered, uh, it really demonstrated that only a broad-based interracial coalition uh, can save it and can defeat uh, radical uh, white nationalism. Uh, Donald Trump garnered an additional 10 million votes after four years. Uh, and just think of what might have happened if the get out the vote efforts that were mentioned, particularly in Georgia, had been less vibrant or successful. The second point I would like to make is um, that from the perspective of a historian of social movements, we, and I would at least argue that um, they can be successful and attract broad political support from various corners of the society if they have a, a morally compelling uh, cause as the struggle against uh, Jim Crow in the 1960s. And I believe and the, uh, and, and the polls bear it out that police brutality is such a course as is the struggle against the carceral uh, state, which again, in parentheses, does not only affect uh, black people. The United States is the number one incarcerator worldwide by any measure. Um, however, on the other hand, and I'm certainly here less enthusiastic than I, as some of the other po panelists and I, hope I'll be forgiven for that. But uh, there's also always the danger that social movements descend into uh, sectarianism. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we'll see. Uh, Ms. Aretz mentioned uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, where is it now? Do you, do you want to give a quick answer, Ms. Aretz, to that um, question thing? You want to try to? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I I think kind of just uh, from maybe a self observation, it seems that Occupy Wall Street was as intense as it was short lived. And on the other hand, um, it might also be too early to tell if Occupy Wall Street mm. uh, has not had a significant influence on and kind of now um, is visible in how we discuss economic injustice um, and uh, how discussions on um, on income and wealth inequality have changed, not only in the United States, but also um, here in Germany and, and, uh, and in many other countries in Europe as well. Um, so um, I, I, I do not have a definite answer to, to where Occupy Wall Street has gone, but I, um, I would be hesitant to declare it um, dead or, or kind of um, disregard its significance um, as it still stands today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my next question goes to Sabine Borek. Sabine, I don't know anyone who has been more concerned with race matters in the US and Germany, both as a scholar and as your general civic engagement, uh, which reaches really far and wide. I'd like to know uh, what changes you have actually seen during the last decades or also years. I don't know how far you want to go. Um, both in shift of racist attitudes and engagement against racism. And um, this concerns both uh, the US, but you, if you want to talk about Germany as well, uh, I'm happy to hear, or we are happy to hear that too. So um, yeah. What no. you actually say? I, I, I will speak about um, Germany, I think, in the next question yeah. that mm -hmm. I, yeah. I have mm -hmm. been anticipating. Mm -hmm. So um, 
Well, one thing is that I think we need to be reminded um, or remind each other that we're talking um, after last Wednesday, mm -hmm. which means we're talking after um, whatever you call it. I don't even think it was a storm. I think it was an invited walk-in of militant fascist organized white men, mostly plus women into the Capitol, which is the sanctum of American parliamentary system. Um, and this has been widely by, um, you know, commentators, white and black, uh, characterized as the ultimate attempt for now, ultimate, to regain unmitigated white power in the US. And that attempt has been, of course, long in the making. I mean, my Twitter timeline has been full with contributions as to tracing like the level of militancy, fascist militancy and organizational formations all the way back to the time to right after the civil rights movement at least. Um, and we should also not forget that we are talking, um, you know, about a very clear and present danger in this moment. Again, on my timeline, there are many people who have been trying to buy food and stock up on water because they don't want to leave their house in Washington. And the other thing is that we don't know, you know, Washington is a fortress right now, but um, there are, you know, dozens of other institutions um, that might, and in my reading of things, will be attacked in the weeks to come. So I think that should bring us all down a little bit from getting sort of too enthusiastic. So while relief about Trump's election loss was widespread, black struggles against democratic party politics of redemption has intensified in the streets as people have said here, and as everybody has watched on the news and social media. The demands for abolition now of the violent white power structure have intensified and actually, um, Alicia Garza has just like in the last few days published a book about movement building, which will interest you all very much. In black theory, um, we see radical moves towards undoing white epistemology and humanist legacies in all areas of the social, cultural and humanist legacies and the political life of racial capitalism. And I want to give you sort of a string of names going all the way back to Walter Rodney and Eric Williams, because one of the massive problems that I keep having with you know, work that is being done in African-American studies, sometimes in the US, sometimes also in other countries is that looking at these things as if we're constantly, we white people, I mean, constantly discovering things again. Whereas in fact, there is like a hundreds of years long tradition of, um, you know, theory making and practical resistance. So generations of scholars like Rodney, Williams, Winter, Cox, Robinson, Kelly, Spillers, Hartman, Wilderson, Sexton, Sharp, Brand, Warren, Walcott, Gilmoy, to just you know, give you two handful. And they all have pointed out the centrality of transatlantic enslavement for modern world making. And I think that's actually one of my gripes with American studies in Germany, that that has not sufficiently been, I mean, not even, you know, we've not even gotten close to really address this. Humanism, considered Europe's noble legacy has been bolstered by slavery and its impact both in enslaved societies and their hinterlands as in Germany and has not been in contradiction to it. The European and new world fervor of we shall not be slaves, which is the slogan of all and any liberation movements that we know has never meant for white people not owning black people and forcing them and not forcing them into the unhumanized position of thingified fungibility for white interests of all kinds. That's Hartman terms. And I think that's another term that hasn't been sufficiently addressed. There is an intimate connection that is between enlightenment's creation of subjectivity, meaning us as white subjects, and the emergence of anti-black racism. And that connection has played out in the long durée of all kinds of violence against black life, 
which has lasted into the present moment and is also transnationally ubiquitous. So I just want to give like one example here, um, which might also, you know, reappear in discussion. The prison industrial complex in the US and the globally trained police practice of racial profiling, which you see all across Europe, have more in common than white liberal society might want to think. So I'm very much arguing in favor of spend a lot more attention, crucial attention on what black theory has actually produced over the last decades and not always be sort of totally riven with the new. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to take the conversation or our attention to the German response uh, to Black Lives Matter uh, now. In June 2020, when the protests against racism and police violence in the US after the death of George Floyd spread to German cities, where many, and these were mostly young people, uh, rallied behind the Black Lives Matter movement and insisted on closer examination of systemic racial injustice on our turf. The Tats raised the question, why so late? Uh, they acknowledged the 2018 demonstrations though, and they referenced a series of murders by the NSU and the attacks in Solingen, Mölln, Halle on, and Hanau. Along these lines, Die Zeit two weeks, two weeks ago featured an article, Turkish Lives Matters, Matter. So one question I would like to address to both uh, Sabine Brock and Manfred Berg is, is there really more engagement against racism that often happens elsewhere, happens here of course as well, than xenophobia in Germany or is that playing out one issue against the other or is it about maybe confusions of terminology, because I think we use the term racism often when we actually talk about um, uh, xenophobia. So I'm wondering whether this is, an, is a defense of the German media. How, how do you think about the relationship of these issues? And um, whoever wants to answer first. Uh, um, uh, can get started. <laughs> Sabina, do you wanna? Yeah, I'm, um, well, first of all, because in the question that you sent us in the, in the written version, you had said, um, asked also about the transfer of US strategies to the German situation. And I wanted to sort of, make a little, just a little sort of, actually just refuse that question because I think that's not for uh, me as a white scholar to judge like what black people mm -hmm. in Germany think they should do or not do. Um, and then as for some kind of exchange and, and interaction between these, you know, black diasporic movements and activities, I just wanted to say just shortly that I think there has been a very long dialogue going on between, um, you know, US Black American feminists, but also other people and Black work in Germany. And I just wanted to sort of mention here, just as mm -hmm. like signposts, uh, Tina Kemp's studies first, and then Fatima El Tayeb's work on um, Black Germans and Black Europeans then there have been like a whole string of Black German studies conferences in the US over the last decade. Um, and there's just recently been a, a book published by Tiffany Florville, if I pronounce her name correctly, um, who is a scholar in German studies and I think the University of Arizona, Rebecca, is that right? Um, University of New Mexico, Tiffany Floral. Sorry. So anyway, um, the book is called Mobilizing Black Germany and is really a magisterial study that has met um, really enthusiastic response in, um, you know, among African-American scholars and activists. So what the other thing that I want to say um, is that I think the epistemic and political struggle of um, 
black Germans, Afro Germans, and other sort of, um, you know, discriminated against groups in Germany is um, sort of meets and doesn't meet. So I think the black struggle is directed against racism and massive anti-blackness, which still and again permeates German educational systems, politics, economies. Um, and so while I would say that xenophobia and classism are massive oppressive forces in Germany, yes, I mean, no doubt about this, they cannot be discussed at the expense of internal German racism and anti-blackness. Rising fascism cannot be framed exclusively as xenophobia. I think that's like an immensely important point as if German citizens, whatever paper status they might have were not its target. I refer to initiatives like among many others, the manifold cooperations between Sharon Otto and Max Scholleck in readings and public debates um, or to the Tage der muslimisch jüdisch Light Kultur organized last autumn by Czolik again with participants Idil Baidar, Nes Kapushu, and Julia Alfandari, Dennis Utlu, and many others. Those corporations model a kind of anti fascist radical democracy from below, which is alliances between Muslim, Jewish, Christian, and secular actors and initiatives between intersectionally articulated joint interventions across sexual and gender identities as well as across racialized and ethnicized identifications. So I do see a growing impetus to rally together against sort of the clear and present danger, mm -hmm. but it's always on the basis of acknowledgement that anti-blackness and racism is our own. So I think these two things are by no means sort of, you know, sh should not be mm -hmm. played up against each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, Manfred. Um, yeah, mm, mm. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I would agree that there's always been a tradition of uh, German interest in American uh, racism having a tacit component of playing a blame game, uh, and I think the Holocaust, of course, plays mm -hmm. a. Mm -hmm. uh, pivotal role mm -hmm. uh, in this story. It's kind of, if you scold us for the Holocaust, uh, wait, what about your uh, Jim uh, Crow uh, uh, system? Uh, then again, and I think it should become obvious that I differ radically from Professor Bröck. Uh, I think um, what we're seeing here is also partly a process of Americanization, uh, which mm -hmm. um, is also nothing new. It's always been very important for German uh, discourses uh, in um, uh, on not only on race, but on virtually any uh, cultural politi political topics. Uh, the fact that we're conducting this panel discussion in English, I think is a, a case in point, never happened in France. Um, but I believe that the, the uncritical adaptation of uh, American concepts can be uh, very uh, misleading. Uh, historically, uh, and I would be very clear on this point, the uh, concept and the dichotomy of whiteness was simply not as constitutive and important as it has been in uh, American history, anti-Semitism, the resentment against immigrants uh, from uh, Southern Europe and Turkey in the post-World War II era, uh, those are issues that I think uh, uh, were much more important on, um, uh, in, in, in uh, shaping uh, German identity. If I may say, uh, if you grew up in, um, in a small town in West Germany in the 1960s and 1970s, you would hardly ever meet a, a black person unless you lived in close vicinity to an American uh, uh, military base. So um, I think there are many, in many ways, uh, we uh, we're having the wrong dis uh, having the wrong discussions here. All right. Um, um, 
I wanted to pick up something else we've mentioned along the way because I, I think much. Oh, Don, you you raise your hand. Okay, then I, it's you first. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say something to the, yeah, the Germany right. and with Black Lives Matter and kind of yeah. mm -hmm. touching on yeah. what Professor yeah. Berg yeah. and um, yeah. Professor Brock Fine. were saying. Um, I think one of the other accomplishments of Black Lives Matter is how we've seen these protests and discussions coming up in Germany. Um, but what's very interesting is um, what Professor Berg pointed to is that it's the pointing of the finger that that's your problem. Um, that's what's happening in the US. And I think there's a really interesting um, panel discussion on, I believe it was uh, IID, where, um, and someone who's a great uh, speaker and activist um, that I highly recommend checking out, um, Hedia Haruna Oker, and she was talking about Black Lives Matter and racism in Germany, and um, a white host, as well as someone who is Turkish, both said, no, racism isn't a problem here. And it's kind of been an answer from police forces when they said, oh, we need to look at our bias, and they've said, no, you don't. Um, and then they basically all lives mattered the situation saying, um, well, all lives matter. We need to look and make sure everything's okay for everyone. And I think her response to that was very telling where she gave, I think it's been said many times, but you know, the situation is if your house is on fire, we're saying we need to put that fire out first instead of saying my house might burn. Um, and I think that's been the response quite often is that, oh, well, everyone has a difficult time. And, and in Germany, look, we're better than in the US, but I don't think in Germany it's being examined until recently quite as much as in the US. And so we can take something from Black Lives Matter and look at that. And um, recently there have been questioning of the namings as well back to statues and such like in Berlin where these discussions have come up, which have never, I don't think would have been um, in discussion beforehand, but I think it's something else, a great accomplishment of Black Lives Matter that that's been pushed over to um, Germany, I think. Um, Professor Brook doesn't agree with me, but I'll turn it over to um, Professor Brookman first. And then um, um, Professor Brookman also. So Sabine, you wanna? Um, yeah, I mean, just sort of like a kleiner Zwischenruf. I mean, um, I think, it seems like a disregard of really years of black critical interventions to say that, you know, if you don't see a black face in your neighborhood, there is no racism possible. I mean, it, it leaves me a little bit speechless, Professor Berg, really, because we all know that racism is something that walks before every black person anywhere. And it's, it's actually can be very virulent and violent even though there is not a black person in the room or in the village or wherever. So, you know, it, it's actually the contrary. I mean, you know, most institutions in Germany is, are so racist that there aren't any black faces. So then would you say there's no racism because, you know, there are no black faces to direct it against? I mean, I think the logic is really um, cramped, sorry. <laughs> Okay, we have lots of hands up. I don't know, um, Ms. Brückmann first, or should should Manfred respond? Sabine, Sabine yeah. I'd, I'd really like to have the opportunity to respond. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, obviously my argument was that there weren't any black people around in the 1960s and 70s, not that there was no racism in uh, Germany, the few occasions that I remember, and you may dismiss it as anecdotal, uh, is that when and if black people were around, they were treated with a certain exotic uh, interest. Now, of course, that may also be uh, castigated as racist, uh, but I have a more benign uh, uh, point of view. Uh, again, um, the the German, of course, we may say German society is uh, irredeemably uh, racist, but I would, I would just 
want to point out that we have certain, that there are certain demographic differences here, as well as uh, if you look at the numbers and particularly look at the uh, the problem of police violence, uh, these are very different dimensions uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of numbers and and proportions. Uh, so I would. Uh, uh, Professor Burke is entitled uh, to her uh, bewilderment, of course, uh, uh, but I, uh, 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 I would certainly disagree with her. Thank you. Uh, Professor Brickman. Thanks. I think there are several aspects here. I agree in part with Martha Beck when it comes to having to be careful to not simply um, use a concept that we use quite successfully for the history of the United States, particularly when you talked about the binary between uh, black and white, uh, manifested in such things as the so-called one drop rule and so on and so forth, simply to Germany. I agree with that. However, <laughs> I'm afraid I have a, a few aspects as well. As we're talking about anecdotal evidence, obviously I grew up as a, as a black kid in a small town in 1980s Germany. And there was quite a difference in my treatment from other people. It was some exotization, but it's mostly been called the German N-word, for example, and saying that I smell. Um, when it comes to the history in Germany, I do agree with Don when he said there, at least um, the Black Lives Matter movement has also led, not uniquely led, but also led to a, a reevaluation or at least debate about German's colonial history as well. And Germany obviously is not half the player, was not half the player, even a quarter or even a fifth as Great Britain or France or Portugal or Spain when it comes, when it came to the transatlantic slave trade. It was not for a lack of trying though by the Brandenburgische Afrikanische Kompanie, for example. Um, they faltered very quickly. They never made a profit. They did sell 17,000 slaves uh, though in South America. So they did try before they faltered. Uh, in Berlin, there was uh, the Berliner Konferenz in 1884 that carved up Africa. Um, Germany had uh, colonies overseas. A lot of, only I think five years ago, the genocide against the Herrera and the Nama were actually acknowledged by the German government. And I think part of that is also to think about anti-blackness in Germany as well. We had debates on the N-word in children's books about blackface in theater. A lot of anti-blackness suddenly made it into the newspapers that might have been surprising to some people because they were below the surface heretofore. I do think, and I agree, um, and the point here, the last point here is, um, it's also not the case that there haven't been black people in Germany ever. I mean, I, I talked about already Brandenburgische Preußische Kompanie. They brought people back to Germany already. There were black people in Europe in the Middle Ages. That is something that sometimes slips the memory of a lot of people in Europe when they say that blackness is a problem of the United States or of Africa. Um, however, I do agree that it's more complicated also in Germany. It's also more complicated in the United States. Uh, when we talk about the importance of xenophobia, of anti-immigration racism, of anti-Semitism, yes, I don't think this is a question of A or B. I think that actually goes well together actually with anti-Black racism, where we also talk about the racism that people fear who are not defined as looking German. And not until 2000 could you actually become a German citizen by being born here in this country. Yeah, it's, it was according to blood and not to territory until 2000. Finally, I do think, and I do agree with uh, Professor Beck when he says there's somewhat of an over-identification though of Germans with African-Americans, particularly in the German Democratic Republic, but also the German Federal Republic. That is, I think, a good way of actually escaping own responsibility for looking at anti-Black racism here, it's also a way of overestimating yourself uh, and your progression, essentially. And I think what Professor Berg said is very important when he says that a lot of the times German, or, or when he says that it has to do with the Holocaust as well, basically pointing fingers in the other direction, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But finally, I do believe that it would make sense to elevate the work that has been done on black people in Germany, on their history, and on their experiences by Tiffany Florvo, by Noah So, by Katharina Oguntoye, by Peggy Piesche, by Mai Ayin. There's been a lot of writing on the experiences of black people and just as anti-Semitism does not need the presence of Jewish people. I agree with Sandra, uh, with, uh, with Professor Brock, that, with Sabine Brock, that the presence of anti-black racism does not, uh, does not need the presence of actual black people. Thank you very much. Sabina, okay, yeah. 
just quickly, I come back to Rebecca because that would also answer one of your questions that you had. Because I've sort of made um, a list, you know, following your mm -hmm. your hint about like the long time that there's been sort of actual black activism in Germany and work being done. So I just wanted to remind us of a few of these things because they do not seem to be general knowledge. And I also, I mean, among white scholars, and I also think that um, that sort of immediately contradicts this idea of, um, you know, Americanization or uncritically taking over American models. So shall I? Yeah. Yeah, okay. go ahead. <laughs> but before I start this, I, I just wanted to say another instance. I don't know if you have read the Tagesspiegel on Saturday, which had one of the most, I mean, an incredible attacks on a young black um, activist who's very well known on Twitter, uh, Yasmina Kunke. And um, that just goes to show that I think the, we are not talking about a situation where, um, you know, the whole problem is so minoritarian that major German actors, you know, the press institutions, et cetera, are not taking notice. If the, if the Tagesspiegel, which is really one of the most, you know, important local newspapers in Germany, in Berlin, can print such an attack on a black activist, then that goes to show something. So, I think I wanted to talk about the surge of interventions in Germany and other European countries um, over the last years, because I think the solidarity movement with Black Lives Matter last year has certainly not come out of the blue and was not just a response to the anti-Black killings in the US or a sort of uncritical takeover of youth as paradigms. So you could speak of, um, and I thank Cedric for Cedric essay for that word, um, an extensive living black intellectual archive of activists and academic work that can speak for itself. So I'm just sort of run you through a, a few examples. So one is the mass questionnaire, the group Each One Teach One, Eyoto from Berlin has issued last year to obtain more statistical evidence of black, about black life and black lives in Germany, aiming at concretizing demands for proactive structural change in higher education, the economy, et cetera. And this has been part of a similar protest during the years since 2015 and the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent, which insisted on the need to, quote, strengthen national, regional, and international cooperation in relation to the full enjoyment of economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights by people of African descent. Various groups have also lobbied for Afro-European interests recruit, resulting in the European Parliament to overwhelmingly approve a resolution in 2019 addressing structural racism, their term, in Europe against Europeans of African descent and calling for reparations for crimes against humanity during European colonialism. There is a years long struggle to decolonize German cities led in most instances by black German activists from the Initiative Schwarze Deutsche and many local groups. There's the epistemic work of, for example, Vanessa Thompson against anti-black violence and racist pro racial profiling. Maisha Aumas black feminist work against racism in the German educational sector. Nadja Ofutai's work against German colonialism. There's the Bachmann Prize for Sharon Otto and a whole host of new literary publications and films addressing black life in Germany, which are really too many to begin naming here. There are many manifold but widely disavowed black German interventions against the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, like for example, by curator Dr. Kupka's, Ifioma Kupka's contributions, while the German mainstream has widely received the debates as a consequence of French President Macron's publicity stunt. There's a regular presence of black German public intellectuals on Deutsche Welle, if anybody is interested. There's Tupoka Ogetis, sorry if I'm pronouncing her name right, I'm hoping I'm not. Her extremely successful educational and activist work with her Instagram account 
And there's a surge of publications about Italy, Scandinavia, Germany, France, by European authors like Michael McEdrain's book on Scandinavia, Olivet O'Taylor's and Johnny Pitts's books on Afro-European histories, and you know, bestsellers like Remy Edologis, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. And the litany of this available, available is what I want to stress. Resistant knowledge could go on and its width and depth stand in sharp contrast to it's been vastly ignored in German higher education across the board. And to even think about that this is all just, you know, adaptation or uncritical adaptation of US paradigms would seem rather mm, preposterous to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is certainly right. I had a couple of more questions to all of you, and um, but many of the issues have been raised. Uh, one of them is uh, also the the connection or the alliance of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement to our decolonization movement. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, yeah the bridges that need to be built. Uh, in, between different groups and even thinking about what the agenda uh, is for Biden in the future. So returning to the US, US, but I see that there are a lot of questions uh, from the audience. And so I think uh, we should open uh, uh, the floor for Q and A. Uh, we meant to do that earlier. Um, maybe we take a little uh, more time than actually planned, we'll see. But I think uh, we should open the discussion, but I want to thank all of you and I'm very happy that you actually interacted and that we got some confrontation going here because that's, uh, that's hard on Zoom, that's much easier when we're closer together. So thanks a lot for now and um, now I turn it over to uh, Alexander Herbs who has the overview uh, and who knows who was first and uh, I, I think we have a quite a lot of questions, right? Is, is that? There was a rather vivid discussion in the chat going on. Okay, all the while. yeah. Um, just in general, for those of you who might have questions, but who haven't sent them yet, you can use the blue hand in the participants or teilnehmer function to uh, say that you want to say something that we will call on you, or you can just type your question in the chat and I'll read it out for you. Um, so far, apart from the discussion in the chat, which is really interesting, read through it if you have the time. There are good book recommendations and other opinions. Um, but there were two uh, questions that I was asked to raise, and I would like to start with a question by uh, Ms. Irene Bez. I hope this was pronounced correctly. Um, this question goes as follows. Is it possible that the movement Black Lives Matter be present in academia? I mean, when we can see changes in which people of color have more presence in academia, or at least be included as a part of the curricula in all careers. As an African descendant from Venezuela, who has been raised and educated through a white European perspective as a normative, and has to carry the historical baggage of slavery and dispossession of land, it is difficult to have access to stories that have been ignored or erased in academia, which has been also part of colonization. Ignoring voices is also a form of violence. And so to come back to the actual question, um, is it possible that the movement Black Lives Matter be present in academia and maybe also change something about the silencing of certain perspectives? And I think this is a question to all of you. I've, I've thought about that actually. Um, I think, uh, to answer the question simply, yes, it should, it needs to be. And, but uh, what I want to mention about that specifically, I think, um, and I want to phrase this correctly, is I think we need to make sure that that is a dis discussion in, in which, of course, we, we center marginalized voices, as, as alluded to, and also as uh, one of the points brought up in the discussion in the chat. Um, and, and, and this is not about, this is an end. I think um, as white academics, there's also a responsibility to, um, to address sad history and engage in that conversation. And of course, that's a delicate point I want to make here, but I think it would be, uh, it would be wrong to remove 
oneself from that discussion uh, as a white person or as a white as a academic as if it would have nothing to do with one. So um, I think um, a presence of Black Lives Matter and the grievances mentioned in academia is uh, necessary, of course. And I think uh, that discussion needs to have happen on a lot of levels um, to sum it up. Thank you very much. Anyone else who would like to say something about that? Well, I might, I might come back, you know, I'm no longer a professor, so, you know, it's sort of, <laughs> yeah, I mean, actively. So it's an interesting position because I can, you know, say things, A, from a perspective of looking back at a long, this long line of efforts to try to change things, but also it's very frustrating because I also look back on, on a long line of, you know, static resistance to, you know, Black Lives Matter sh should matter actually in German academia on all kinds of levels. But I want to sort of push it into a question for German American studies actually. And I think if one has witnessed like the, to me, I mean, almost scandalous immobility of the German American Studies Association in the last years, where even talking about diversity, which has been, you know, almost critiqued to death as a concept by people, you know, all across the board, and just to mention Sarah Ahmed, and there's this absolute resistance to even begin thinking about structural change in higher education, you know, the DGFR being just one uh, association here in terms of proactive hiring policies, you know, general overhaul of the curriculum, um, different funding premises. I mean, you know, we could make a list together if we had more time, but um, it's really more than overdue. And I could actually really see like, I mean, I don't know how, how much longer, you know, we, and by we, I mean, you know, white academics and specifically white Americanists want to delay this issue. Like, how long will you tell people that, okay, we need like more discussion, we need like more information, we need like more this and more that instead of just doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Other, other comments on, on the question? If not, um, I'd suggest you had another question. Um, I have another yeah. one, yes, okay. by uh, Mr. Justin Fernando. Um, he says, since the Black Lives Matter mobilization in 2020, there has been a proliferation of jobs in diversity, equity, inclusion, as the field in many organizations in the US and also globally. What advice do you have as scholars for practitioners in this field in the US, Germany, and worldwide. As an alum, um, he also wants to give his thanks to uh, Professor Sierke and to Professor Schäfer Wünsche and the whole program of the University of Bonn and the University of Cologne. Yeah. Great to hear from you. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, and to come back to the question, it would be what you as scholars would advise practitioners in this field, be that here or in the US or wherever else. Maybe this is something for Don, uh, because I mean, we have done at least a little bit of anti-racism training, for instance, in our institute. I don't know whether this is an answer to the question really, but, um, uh, and I was always sort of wondering whether somebody really wants to engage in anti-racism or ra yeah, racism trainings, because you then of course acknowledge that you're a racist, uh, and that you need that sort of stuff. But um, maybe you can uh, address this somehow. And of course, there are other answers uh, possible. Um, yeah, I think first what you just said is an important point. And I think that's maybe many people's reticence to it that by mm -hmm. taking place in said training that they're racist. Um, and I think actually I'd like really, and I highly recommend, um, uh, Ibram X. Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, but mm -hmm. um, even better if you want more in depth of history of racism stamped from the beginning by him is wonderful. But um, How to Be Anti-Racist, I think importantly starts with him telling a story about how he was racist, um, acted as um, in a racist manner um, when he was a kid 
And I think it's important to, or the dis uh, distinction he makes between being a racist, being that all the time, or acting in a racist manner and acknowledging that and confronting it and changing that, um, as well as being an anti-racist, actively um, being against racist policies and using, if you are in a position of power, your power to um, fight those racist policies. Uh, as he says in the book that, you know, most people aren't racist all the time. It's not an active state of being, just as being not racist is not the opposite of um, being anti, um, of mm -hmm. being a racist. And I think that's really important um, when looking at these things. And I think that's maybe why um, we had a wonderful um, anti-racism training, um, but there weren't nearly as many people as I would have mm -hmm. liked to have seen there. Mm -hmm. um, and but what was great is how many open discussions it brings about. And I think this, um, people need to first understand and whomever is giving it needs to make it a safe space for everyone, that everyone feels comfortable regardless of their background. Um, and yeah, that would be my first thing. Um, and then I also kind of back to what some of the questions were before is to not put the burden of being anti-racist and acting against racist policies on those who are affected by it. That, um, mm -hmm. And so great books to read within it. I said again, Ibram X. Kendi. Um, Rennie Edo Lodge was mentioned by Professor Brock. I think it's a wonderful one. And since the, the penal system in the US came up, I would recommend um, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander as another um, great book. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that completely answers it, but, um, or sort of answers it, I don't know. Thanks, thanks a lot. Very good recommendations. Other, other answers to the question posed, but we do have more questions I see, right? Um, we do, and I think um, if no one else has an immediate comment on that, I would call on Miss uh, Elizabeth Clark Hasters because I think her comment might play into the discussion. Um, so if you like, you can unmute yourself and just start speaking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Great. I, I, I thought about what uh, was said here that one of the great problems in working in anti-racism and anti-discrimination is that in the moment that a person says, this is racist behavior, the pain of being called racist, which did not happen by the way, um, the pain of being called a racist is more important than the information that we want to exchange. So what happens is when we do an anti-discrimination training, we spend a lot of time, especially, and this is especially why people of color should not be asked to do this work. We spend a lot of time making the white people feel okay again. And that cannot be the basis of anti-discrimination training. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing is the burden of this being on people of color, uh, uh, that tends to lead to people of color having to carry the burden and having actually not really a place where they can also discuss and feel free and get rid of all of these, 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 this pain. Um, I think it, there needs to be a lot of work done on that, on how do we over this, this, this chasm, how do we talk to one another? The basic experiences are so different but there can only be progress when we manage to have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. So how do we have this dialogue without, uh, without grabbing people's pain? Mm -hmm. If you understand what I mean, you know? Um, 
these, these conversations are uncomfortable and painful for both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to have them. So my question and actually my work is about how to do this without, without putting the pain in the, in the foreground, without putting that in front. Um, yeah, that was an answer to a question which was actually then another question. <laughs> but um, I think that's something that, that needs to be thought about in all of this, uh, all of these uh, anti-discrimination and anti-racist things, mm -hmm. especially also in the intersectionality. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, um, yeah, sensitivity around those points. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, this is a really something that we've got to work on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I think that was an important comment. Um, Sabina, do you want to um, um, I, I, I was thinking of Sabina yes. Bork at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry, because <laughs> I just unmuted myself. Okay, okay. Fine. Go ahead. Hmm? Oh, okay. Um, I, uh, I wish I had an answer to that question, of course, but I, I want to just throw something uh, in there that I um, was reminded of earlier as well. And I feel it's relevant now in this discussion and, and when we talk about how to have these discussions, um, of course, n very, very pressing and necessary. And, uh, but how do we do it without um, asking people of color to recall painful experiences to, um, uh, to constantly um, emphasize the, the significance of these discussions. And I'm reminded of a quote by, or it's more of a paraphrasing now by Toni Morrison, um, uh, along the lines of white people seem to have a serious problem with, with racism and white people should do something about it and leave me out of it. And um, that's what I alluded to earlier. I mean, this is a kind of difficult discussion to have because of that. And, and yet I think, um, uh, the, the, this discussion and, and, and um, kind of underlining a importance that white people should not remove themselves from, from this discussion, meaning um, as um, Mr. Norman uh, alluded to that uh, in anti-racist training, there's kind of a, a sensitivity about uh, then people feeling attacked because they might have been racist. Um, I think that's also a discussion that needs to be had kind of alongside in, in all of this and um, probably another point that makes it more complicated. Thank you very much. Um, any other comments on the issue? As we see, I mean, we're discussing issues on, on many different levels and uh, uh, shows sort of the complexity of the issue we're addressing here. Um, is there another question? Um, yeah. Okay. There are more questions. There are more questions. I think we should probably only take one more or two. Or two. I don't know. It depends really on on the participants. I know that uh, uh, Professor Berg Manfred needs to go at some point, and we didn't want to uh, stretch things out. But uh, let's have uh, two more questions, and then. Yeah. All right. In this case, I would just go through chronologically as they came in because yeah. I wouldn't want to like right. uh, mm -hmm. change anything here. Then the next question would be by Annalena Schwarzfeger. Um, could you elaborate on the presence and or the functions of issues relating to economic inequality in the Black Lives Matter movement? So we would move to a very different part mm -hmm. of the actual mm -hmm. discussion. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe you could say something about that mm -hmm. as well. I think that that was a question I was actually going to pose to Sabina Aret. So uh, there is your question. <laughs> um, yes. Um, well, first of all, I think um, it's a, um, and which is why I think it's an important question. It's a foundational part of Black Lives Matter. When um, when I look at the the, the narratives, the, the writings, the movement texts that I've specifically focused on grievances related to economic inequality, to the racial wealth gap, to um, poverty, poor black communities, communities 
um, are really at the center of these narratives and kind of communicated, I argue, as a, a mechanism um, of systemic racism. And, um, and kind of during the communication of these grievances and, and the, 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 the centering of these grievances, I think um, uh, their function specifically comes in when demands and goals, and this goes back to the very beginning of our discussions, come in because kind of these issues, these grievances related to economic inequality then are kind of at the center of then policies aiming to address them and um, kind of uh, um, structurally change something here are uh, kind of the, 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 the first really concrete demands that, um, that we can really grasp to, to um, maybe get a, get a hold on this really, really, really big discussion and something that is um, uh, easily visible and that could change. And I think that's one of the reasons why in um, like prognostic framing in, in, in Black Lives Matter um, policies related to economic inequality and uh, specifically addressing that um, uh, move to the center a lot and, and uh, own, not only in movement text but also in kind of a popular representations of it. So yeah, I, I'd say that economic inequality is an integral part of, of Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Um, I, I would suggest that, is there any other comment on, on the question? If not, we'll take the last question and then wind things up. Um, yes, that might actually be a nice question to summarize the things because it kind of wants to focus on the main issues again. It was raised by Isra Jahan Kazi. And the question is, which theories are most crucial to understand or describe the racism related to black people in America? And maybe as a sum up of the whole thing, one could also contrast or combine that with Germany. Big question, who, who wants to take that up? Go ahead. I can start. I can start. <laughs> and I'll be very interested in hearing from all of the other panelists as <laughs> to their suggestions. I think a crucial um, would be, I'm not trying to just, it's, it's really hard to decide, but um, I would say absolutely start with W.B. Du Bois and the source of Black folk, also Black Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. I think critical race theory, um, as it moves out from um, the, the, the the courtroom essentially to a broader uh, application to US society is very important. Obviously black studies and black history more institutionalized in the late sixties, beginning at the 1970s. Black feminist thought, think of Patricia Hill Collins of Bell Hooks, for example. Also look at the writings of black freedom struggle activists that starts with Ida B. Wells over Marcus Garvey um, to Malcolm X to Martin Luther King, particularly his book, Where Do We Go From Here? It's very important because it gives a, a look back essentially or reviews what has been accomplished so far, what he thinks is still missing. I would also add John Lewis to that with Walk With The Wind. Um, Cornel West, for example, has also written uh, on the philosophy essentially of blackness and particularly when it comes to economic deprivation of the black society. And obviously I would also add what Kimberly Crenshaw and many others have written about intersectionality. There's a very good edition of Science from 2013, but it's still pretty, pretty relevant talking about the many aspects of intersectionality that would come to mind here. Concerning Germany, I would repeat absolutely, many of you have already mentioned a lot of authors, but I would say definitely Katharina Okuntoje and Farbe Beken, um, Maya Yim, Dagmar Schulz have written that. Um, we have Peggy Piesch who has written quite a lot, especially also about the experiences of black people in the German Democratic Republic. Noah So has written about it. Sharon O'Toole has written about it. Tiffany Florville has written about racism in Germany and the list goes on. And I'm gonna stop here and I'm looking forward to other recommendations. Okay, I think you're seconding Zabina's uh, 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 Wiener Brock's list. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether we wanna end add something to the list and we, we have been compiling a lot of uh, ad advice with regard to literature and I, th I think that that's quite wonderful because it also underlines the fact how, how theory still matters uh, for political practice as well and uh, political awareness of course. Um, um, Zabine, do you want to add anything? No, the just, list is of, well I, you know I could 
like probably <laughs> make a very long list, but I just it just occurred to me to suggest Cedric Robinson's work. I've already done that in the chat as far as particularly this whole interest in um, you know the economy and the, the economic intersections um, because racial capitalism should be like a standard work for um, for you know that kind of lane if one wants to go down there but also I mean one of the things I think that's important is to widen the view I mean Rinaldo Walcott from Canada for example has recently continuously stress this idea of trying to get a, like a wider grip on, um, you know, black struggles and, and um, includes, for example, Caribbean intellectuals mm -hmm. you know, from Rodney to Sylvia Winter. I said that before. So, you know, I mean, you can imagine dozens and dozens of uh, classes. And I think that's actually part of the problem um, you know, to make Black Lives Matter is that um, there have to be concerted efforts to bring Black knowledge and Black epistemology into the center of thinking about the modern world. That sounds like really programmatic and I mean it in really exactly like that because as long as it's considered ornamental addenda to the canons that we leave unchanged, it won't change anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sabina. Um, um, I think this is a wonderful last word. There could be other last words, and there are no last words to this conversation because we will uh, keep uh, talking about these issues, I fear, um, especially probably also in the next uh, four years of uh, the democratic ad administration. And I think many, men many issues have been mentioned that will become important. One of them is sort of to bridge a certain chasm to bridge uh, the conversation between different groups and to have a dialogue uh, and yeah. to confront uh, the pains in many ways. Um, so um, I know that there are more hands up. Um, Don, last word, I saw your hand. Uh, you wanted to add something? Before I close no, it off, I was just going to add, um, and uh, Rebecca kind of beat me to it. I, I said I love. I wanted to say I loved her list, um, and we just added uh, Audrey Lord. Yes. Um, <laughs> and specifically, your science science will not protect you, and um, her biomythography Zami. Um, I highly, highly recommend. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I think we've com been compiling a list uh, in the background, and uh, Alexander helps invites you all to send her recommendations. We're going to compile a list and, um, and put it on our website. So uh, this is COVID-19 time. Uh, you got time to read. Uh, so um, you need good recommendations and maybe also uh, recommendations that you wouldn't have thought of before. So um, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists. I think it was a great discussion. I didn't interfere that much. Uh, I wanted to hear you. Um, I think we've shown how complex the issues are, but also how much has been already done um, and how much so easily gets forgotten and is then be rewound. Um, so, um, I assure you we'll continue the conversation. I thank you a lot. Um, uh, maybe you were, you're in contact and also the audience may in, be in contact with you about certain issues. Uh, I would also invite that. Um, thanks a lot um, uh, for being here tonight and um, we're over time. I apologize for that. We could have been here much longer even. Uh, which we don't want to. Uh, I want you all to enjoy the evening and uh, I, I thank, thank you all a lot. Um, I want to, however, close uh, um, by uh, announcing uh, the last event in our lecture series. Uh, and this, um, uh, we have a slide for that. Um, this is a talk by one of our, um, of our colleagues, Dr. Katharina Fackler. Uh, who will speak about oceanic intimacies, whaling lives, life writing, and col colonial ecologies in the Pacific, 1845 to 51. 
Um, a very different topic, uh, but colonialism is in there. And um, so even there, we will uh, keep the conversation going. Uh, if you're interested, join us on February the 2nd. And again, uh, to all of you, uh, thank you uh, for, for a wide ranging, ranging conversation and for not shying away from uh, disagreeing. I, I'm very happy about that too. So, so have, a, have a good night. And uh, for those of the panelists who want to stay in uh, to sort of exchange a couple of views, uh, stay in. Uh, we have to wait until everybody else leaves, however. So uh, if that takes too long, uh, we can talk on a different occasion. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks again. Have a good night. Good night.